In the Bible, in the book of Genesis, basically the first thing God does is to create animals and plants and humans according to his wishes. We are now trying to gain this divine ability to ourselves. So here we have Yuval Noah Harari saying we will have divine abilities. What's your reaction, John? <laughs> well, the first person to suggest that human beings could become gods was a talking snake inspired by the devil. It is a pleasure to have with me once again my dear friend, Dr. John Lennox, who is a professor at Oxford University, is professor of pure mathematics and philosophy of science. There he has PhDs from Oxford, Cambridge, the University of Wales, as I say, uh, pointed out in the previous podcast. John is a former student. He attended the lectures um, while at Cambridge University of C.S. Lewis. He is a Christian. I, I don't want to chiefly call you a Christian apologist. You're a scientist. You're a mathematician. And you are a defender of the Christian faith. But you're, you're much, much more than that. You are in the, the lane of the mainstream as opposed to being um, just simply off in the you know, the section of the bookstore that's the inspiration, Christian inspiration section of the bookstore. But we're talking about your book, 2084, Artificial Intelligence and the Future of Humanity. Great to have you with me, John. Oh, thanks very much. It's good to talk with you once more. Well, I, it seems to me that a logical place to begin is I was reflecting on this just this, this past week that in 2006, I made the journey to Oxford University to convince you that we needed to take on the so-called new atheists who at that time were making a real splash, not just in the, the academic world, but in the broader culture. And we needed to take on those guys and push back in their assertion that there was no God and uh, no hope, no meaning, no justice, no anything of, of great significance. And that led to a number of books and debates, both yours and mine. And it seems to me that this is a continuation of the same debate when we're talking about the individuals that we're talking about in artificial intelligence. Does this do you feel like the same discussion, just, just further down the line? It clearly is, because the, I think the simple point to make here is that uh, the main drivers of AI, and particularly the transhumanist branch of it, are atheists, and that has been noticed by many people. That doesn't mean there are no Christians or theists working in artificial intelligence, but the things that are hitting the headlines, like the book of Yuval Noah Harari, Homo Deus, these people are atheistic. And so they're continuing the crusade, if we can call it that, of Richard Dawkins, uh, in a slightly different area. But yes, it's very much the same thing. Well, you mentioned Harari, and we add him to the list of characters that made up the so-called new atheist guys like um, the aforementioned Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens, Daniel Dennett, Sam Harris, and now we add Harari. And we talked about Harari briefly in part one of this interview Let's revisit him uh, because Harari has made some rather outrageous assertions. And one of them is the fact that he claims that AI, artificial intelligence, has the power to make us gods. Let's listen to this brief excerpt from an interview that he did. The next big projects of humankind will be to overcome old age and death to find the keys, the secret to happiness, and to basically upgrade humans into gods. This is why the title Homo Deus, God Man. And I don't mean it as a kind of literary metaphor. 
I mean it in, as in, in the literal sense that for thousands of years, humans have imagined gods in a particular way. They ascribed particular abilities and qualities to gods. And we are here in a church, and the walls are full of these descriptions of what God can do. And we are now seriously in the business of acquiring these traditional divine abilities and qualities to ourselves. Uh, whether it's trying to overcome death and gain immortality, or whether it's gaining the ability to create and design life according to our wishes. In the Bible, in the book of Genesis, basically the first thing God does is to create animals and plants and humans according to his wishes. We are now trying to gain this divine ability to ourselves. It's very likely that in the 21st century, the main product, the most important products of the human economy will no longer be just vehicles and textiles and food and weapons. The main products will be bodies and brains and minds. And in a way, we are even reaching beyond what ancient religions ascribed to, to the gods. Because the gods, like Jehovah in the Bible, they could create only organic beings. If you look, if you're a creationist, and you look at the world, so all these animals, all these plants, God created them, and they are all organic. Now humans are trying to do better than that. Wow. So here we have Yuval Noah Harari saying we will have divine abilities. What's your reaction, John? <laughs> well, the first person to suggest that human beings could become gods was a talking snake inspired by the devil. And according to Genesis, that ought to make us slightly leery when we find Harari suggesting the, the very same thing. This is a very ancient idea. Uh, the notion that human beings can become gods. And one notices that Harari means it literally. Of course, it's off the scale in terms of speculation because we don't know, for example, we don't actually know anything about or very little about the nature of consciousness. So we're not going to be able to create consciousness uh, scientists can't build something unless they know exactly what it is. Uh, and so I, I fear that there's an enormous amount of hype here. Now, what people can do to a certain extent, they can simulate certain aspects of human beings and create those in robots, etc., and artificial intelligence can do lots of things. But as we discussed last time, an AI system normally does one thing that requires human intelligence. We're nowhere near the kind of thing Harari is talking about. And the huge barrier, as I see it, is consciousness. And of course, Harari is one voice. There are many other voices who, who think that this is absolute hype. And his notion that he's going to solve the problem of death as a technical medical problem and solve the problem of aging and all the rest of it. There are very strong scientific voices to say that he's in cloud cuckoo land, actually. Well, you anticipate my next question, which is he not only says that uh, we will have the, the ability to create life, he says mm. we will have the ability that goes beyond that of uh, Jehovah, beyond that of the God of the Bible, we, we will have abilities that exceed that of the gods. Yes, but you notice the mistake. Uh, there's a, there's a, an error in what he says. He said God only created organic beings. That's false. According to Scripture, God himself is not an organic being. God is spirit. 
and he created spirit beings. We often call them angels or demons. And human beings are bipartite at least. In other words, they're flesh and spirit. So on, on that very important point, he's wrong. So to say we can go beyond uh, God and create beings that are not tied to biology as we understand it, they're simply false. Uh, according to the biblical record. And and then there's a question of going beyond. Uh, that seems to imply that there's a superiority in the idea of unhitching uh, the human mind, for instance, from a biological base. And the reasons for that, of course, are that our bodies degenerate and we die. And Harari doesn't like that. So he wants to solve that, as he calls it, the technical problem. And he expects by the end of this century that we live in a world where, as he himself puts it, uh, human beings may die, but they don't have to die. Um, there will be the technical capacity to prevent it. And helps you get all this cryonics and people freezing their brains uh, where in the hope that one day these problems will be solved and they will be uploadable, whatever that means, onto silicon. But what would be uploaded is very questionable. The idea of uploading brains is a very vague concept. Uh, do they mean the contents of the mind? And if so, that depends on consciousness. We don't know what consciousness is. There's just so much wild speculation here. And I'm afraid that I feel a lot of it is sheer hubris and it fits absolutely into the notion that has tracked humanity all through history. And that is the desire to be God because the lie has been spread in, into humans' minds that God, if there is one, and I do believe there is one, the God Jehovah, the God of the Bible, wants to suppress human beings, doesn't want them to rise to his own level. And the initial scenario in the Garden of Eden was where uh, God forbade uh, one particular fruit. And the idea there was that humans were moral beings. And what was insinuated into their minds was that Really, if you disobey this, you will rise in the hierarchy of being and you will be as God's knowing good and evil. And there a huge mistake is made by many writers. They say God is against knowledge. It wasn't the tree of knowledge that was forbidden to them. It was the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And it turned out that that's the very thing that you do not want to have. So, there are many things playing out here, but the basic one, that human desire to be God that we saw in the pharaohs, that we saw in many Assyrian and Babylonian emperors, and of course, even in more recent times with people like Ceausescu, the awful uh, desire to be God as a result of which, of course, millions of people get killed. So uh, I'm... <clears throat> pretty pessimistic about uh, I don't think he's going to reach that because what he's talking about are things that are completely imponderable to science as yet. Remember, Harari's not a scientist, Larry. He is a historian and he is responding to, well, he's using a, a pretty fertile imagination to join this hyped up transhumanist agenda that we're going to go beyond the human. Now, it has got all kinds of problems associated with it, but we can go into those as we get to them. He, he You know, he's really even not much of a historian, uh, John. He's he's a bit of a what might be called a futurist, um, a P.T. Barnum kind of character. We must remember that in that particular interview, he's promoting and selling his book, God, Man, and that's that's a major part of, you know, you refer to it as hype. Um, I think that's the appropriate word because, I, you know, we're discussing him. He's selling books. Um, he's getting what he wants out of that. 
This leads to an interesting discussion about the soul, something that's missed in all of this. You were talking about it's not really even clear what would be uploaded, you know, to a machine um, since we don't really know what consciousness is. Is it just, you know, the contents of the brain, you know, our knowledge, uh, our personality that's uploaded? What of the soul? What of the soul? How does the soul figure in to the discussion of immortality and transhumanism? The soul is a concept we meet in the Bible. Unfortunately, I, I find it difficult to define because it appears to have different meanings according to context. Uh, for example, uh, Scripture says that eight souls were saved in Noah's Ark. That's just eight people. So the word soul can mean a person. And yet, in one of the letters of John, you get an apposition something like this, I hope you are well, even as your soul is well. So the soul appears, it looks a little bit as if it is in some sense a part of the person. And then you get the Hebrew concept in Genesis that humans became living souls and the word nefesh for soul, and it seems to also mean spirit. We're dealing with uh, difficulties that... Um, are hard to separate from one another. But it seems to me that at the very least, if you take body, soul, and spirit, we are certainly in the realm where human beings are not purely material, and I will go further than that. Their soul, whatever it is, or their spirit is not an epiphenomenon, is not an emergent property of their physical bodies. It's something else. So in that sense, I would be very happy by being called a dualist. In other words, I can say to you, Larry, I'm getting old. My body is not in good shape. Now, <laughs> that body is something that is not I. The I that says my body is not in good shape cannot just be that body. There's a, a transcendence even within human beings. And it seems to me this is consistent with what the Bible is saying. What's very interesting, of course, is the fact that some leading scientists, and one in particular is David Chalmers, who's one of the world experts on the mind-body problem. What is the mind? What is the body? What is the difference? Has moved to a kind of dualism although he is not a theist, but he's convinced by the evidence that there is something more than body. And that's probably enough for this kind of discussion. There is something more. I can talk about I have a body. I'm not prepared to say I am a body. Now, if the word soul can contain in certain circumstances the concept of body, then we can say, well, Larry Taunton's a good soul, you know. <laughs> and that's just talking about you. Uh, for sure. And, you know, let's, let's go back just a bit because I don't want to make assumptions that everyone who's listening to us knows exactly what we're talking about here. Define for us transhumanism. Oh, transhumanism is a movement, really. And uh, Harari is at the heart of it. Nick Bostrom in Oxford is, is one of the leading players. And the idea is that it's going beyond the human in exactly the ways that Harari was saying in that clip, going beyond the human in different ways. First method that is being actively researched is to upgrade humans. He uses that word. And that can be done either by implants of various kinds of technology. And he talks about our smartphones eventually becoming part of ourselves and so on. It, uh, human capacities can be enhanced by drugs. That's another way of doing it. But research on transhumanism, so to speak, to move beyond the human 
is either enhancing existing humans or the much more speculative thing is, as you were referring to it earlier, starting from scratch on a base that is non-organic, probably silicon or something like this, and building something that can contain but go way beyond the capacities, all the capacities of a normal human being. So transhumanism is in the business of constructing super intelligences. As a Christian, why does the body matter? I mean, why would God object to me uploading my brain to a robot and thereby avoiding physical pain, disease, and possibly even death? Help us, help us understand the theological implications of this. Well, of course, <laughs> the assumptions behind that question are many because we haven't a clue, as we both agreed, what uploading our brains to a robot would mean. But I, I think there's some serious thinking to be done here, uh, Larry, as to the position of the body in biblical thinking. That that is striking in light of what I was saying earlier, that God did not only make beings that were at least bipartite with body, soul, and spirit. He made spirit beings, angels. So God is perfectly capable of making beings that are not attached to bodies. So that objection then drops, but it leads to the question, why is it then that we are both body and spirit? And the interesting thing is this, that <clears throat> the, our bodily experience this is given to us by God. But our situation on this earth, our presence on this earth, is actually temporary. According to Scripture, this is a temporary planet. Now, let's factor the Christian message into this because it helps us to clear the contours of what is going on. And let's contrast it with Harari's promise. Harari says we're going to solve the problem of death and we're going to enhance human beings and turn them into gods. Now, firstly, he's too late. The problem of physical death was solved when God raised Christ from the dead. Now, this is crucial in the debate when we're looking at it in the wide picture, the, the wide lens that the Bible gives us. Secondly, the idea of uploading. Uh, we just have to change the words very slightly and we get a biblical concept. Because Christ promised that anybody who repented of the mess they'd made of their lives and possibly lives of others, sin we call it, and trusted him as saviour would one day be uploaded. In other words, they would be raised from the dead even as Jesus was. And what is very interesting here is that after death dimension has a bodily aspect to it. God is hasn't done with the idea of body. He hasn't become a Greek philosopher of the kind who thought that matter was evil. And the most important thing is to disengage from matter. And partly, I suspect, this lies behind, kind of Gnosticism lies behind the transhuman agenda. No. God is going to raise our bodies, but they're going to be different. And they are not going to be liable to suffering and pain and death and all this kind of thing. So what the question you raise is going to be answered, not by abolishing body, but by giving us a different body. That is, if we're prepared to trust Christ. So that there is an answer to the question, but it's not the answer people either expect, and it's not the answer many people want to hear, because, of course, it involves a thing that many of these people, in common with the new atheists who preceded them, are not prepared to face, and that is the flaw in human nature as such uh, that we call sin, the fact that we ha have fallen and disobeyed God, and that needs to be dealt with. And Harari is trying to create a utopia 
with and bypass the problem of human sin. It cannot be done. The Germans tried to do it, the Nazis, uh, during World War II uh, and before it. The Russians tried to do it to create a new man, and they had very little technology available. And the net result of those attempts to create the pure Aryan or the communist new man in Russia was simply a river of blood. And I just fear that the current attempt, if we're not careful, may end up in exactly the same quarter. Well, I would want to point out to people who are listening, uh, just restating slightly some of what you've just said here is, you know, we're told in Scripture that Satan, Lucifer, wanted to make himself like the Most High. He, he wanted to sit on the throne of God. And that sin, that tendency just continues down through the ages to our present time, where the kind of people, the transhumanists that someone like uh, Yuval Noah Harari would represent are repeating that very same thing. Um, there is immortality to be had. It is offered to humanity in the person of Jesus Christ. But having rejected that, they say, no, we want, we want to create it ourselves. We want to sit on that throne. And so they're seeking to create immortality via other means. Yes, it's a Babel project. And as such, it will fail because it has no moral dimension to it. That's very noticeable. It has no moral dimension. And that, of course, in another context, is one of the great problems of artificial intelligence. But people find this kind of thing attractive. You see, we mentioned earlier that Harari is a historian, but there are very serious scientists saying this kind of thing. Our uh, astronomer royal, who's a brilliant man, Lord Martin Rees, is saying exactly the same thing. And um, he expects that in the future, uh, there'll be, it won't be humans that take over the world. And it will be some kind of product that we have created. And there's a big danger there, of course, as well, because C.S. Lewis, who you mentioned in the introduction, Larry, was prescient in being very leery of the idea of a group of boffins altering life and creating life and reducing life to a head, uh, a physical head, uh, there's his famous book, That Hideous Strength, that imagines this in all its gruesome detail. And it is remarkably prescient. I read it again mm. recently, and I've interacted with it in my book. And it's where he's talking about and his summary, which he wrote in 1940 in his book, The Abolition of Man, was that what will be made uh, won't, of course, will be an artifact and he has this chilling statement, the final triumph of humanity will be the abolition of man because what they have produced is an artifact. It won't be a human being. So there are all those things that need to be thought about, but not many people are talking about them, which is why I put them in my book. And I suspect that's why it's attracted quite a bit of attention as my experience has been. Everyone's going to encounter pain in their life. The questions deal with the degree of one's pain and the source of one's pain and how we deal with our pain. In this course, I'm speaking very personally about my own pain and some of the lessons that I've learned in coping with pain, how we minister to people with pain and what kind of perspective are we to have on the big questions that surround pain and human suffering. Why would you take a course like this? Well, presumably, if you haven't suffered in your own life, you will encounter people who do. And undoubtedly, some of them are people who are very near and dear to you. I think it'd be very helpful for you to take a course like this in order to understand 
what they're experiencing and the way that you minister to people in those kinds of circumstances. So I'd love for you to take this course of mine. And I want to tell you this, that when you subscribe to Tome, you get access not just to my course, but to more than a hundred other courses that are dealing with very practical issues and assisting you in living and in flourishing. So where can you get this course? Well, you can't get it at Amazon. You can't get it at Apple. You can't get it at Netflix. You can only get it at Tome. So I want you to go to tomeapp.com slash pain to learn more about my course. Let's get back to the podcast. Uh, Aquinas made a statement that runs something like this. This is kind of my summary of his thought. God made animals, all flesh, no spirit. He made angels, all spirit, no flesh. And he made man a composite of both. Therefore, he can ascend to the higher or he may descend to the lower, to the beast. Uh, that kind of thinking um, kind of anticipates where you're going in this book. And that is that you see something of, um, you know, what Revelation speaks of as the beast potentially in our artificial intelligence. Develop that for us. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and uh, what I want to say in the book is when you look at some of the AI scenarios that are presented by scientists this time, like Max Tegmark of Princeton, I think he is at. It's remarkable how parallel some of them are to what we read in Revelation. The difference is that people will take a futuristic scenario written by a physicist seriously, but they will dismiss the scenario in scripture. But that's a very superficial uh, attitude because we can see within our society over history the kind of trends that would clearly lead to the following set of concepts. Firstly, a world government. Secondly, a highly controlled surveillance society where the economy is controlled. And the interesting thing in the book of Revelation is you end up with a, a world leader who's seen under the image of a wild thing, a beast, an animal. And we understand that perfectly. We know exactly what it means when a totalitarian, totalitarian government behaves like a wild beast. But the interesting thing is, according to Revelation, this wild thing actually controls the economy by means of putting a mark on everybody's right hand or forehead. Now, we're getting very close to that now. That used to be regarded as rather silly. But of course, in the end, we are now using biomarkers uh, like our retina, our fingerprints, of course, have been used for a long time. And it's very easy to see that a totalitarian government could insist that you couldn't go to an ATM without it seeing your eyes. And therefore, the central controlling factor, uh, the central server, could shut you out of any financial transactions at, at will. They're and doing it in China. Exactly what, yes, they're doing it. And Max Tegmark, in his book Life 3.0, his main uh, contending scenario is very parallel to that in Revelation. It's called the Omega Corporation, oh, sorry, the Prometheus Corporation. It runs the entire world and it forces everybody to wear a bracelet, which is a bit like an Apple Watch uh, and so on. It's got all the complex functionality. But if people don't, it monitors what they do, it observes everything, hears everything, and records everything and uploads it to a central server. And if what it observes doesn't fit in with the norms of this totalitarian world government, it injects people with a lethal injection. It kills them. And that is almost identical with the book of Revelation. Now, people take that scenario seriously. And I want to say, okay, fine, do so. But please note 
that this has been anticipated 2,000 years ago by an almost identical scenario, which actually I would take much more seriously because throughout history, we see this drive to turn humans into gods because one of the major characteristics of this wild thing is, and it's explicitly said, to be a human being who sits in the temple, whatever that means, in a religious place, and claims to be God. Now, the interesting thing there, Larry, is that quote that I've made is not from the book of Revelation, which is, of course, full of imagery. It comes from Paul's second letter to the Thessalonians. And uh, talking during the Roman Empire, he, he talked about this uh, wild leader under a different designation. He called him the man of lawlessness. And that doesn't mean that he didn't believe in law. It's spiritual lawlessness, a person that defies God in, in a dramatic way by claiming to be God. And he says that this person, this leader, will be destroyed by the coming of Christ. That's in the plain text. And Paul says, you know, I told you this when I was with you. And that's interesting. And he explains why he told them. He said, the mystery of this kind of spiritual lawlessness is already working in your own Roman society. It was. The Caesars were, at least after their deaths, being regarded as gods. And Paul says, watch that trend because that's going to grow. And now we have it again with Hamadeus and Harari. We're getting exactly the same thing. So Paul's words are coming true. Now, I'm not identifying what's going on with what Paul says. But no, you're what careful I'm saying not to do is that. that. Yes, the plain text of 2 Thessalonians and the imagery in Revelation fit together. I want to make one more point about imagery. People often think that the use of images and metaphors means that there's nothing in it at all. It's fairy stories. That's nonsense. One of the most important things I learned from C.S. Lewis was about grammar. And he taught me very clearly that metaphors always stand for something real. In other words, if I say my heart is broken, I don't mean this pump is broken, but I'm talking about a real experience that's devastating my emotional life. And when the book of Revelation and the book of Daniel uses these pictures of wild animals, it tells you what some of them denote. For instance, one of them denotes, in the ancient world, uh, denotes a Babylon. Another denotes Medo-Persia and another Gr Greece. And the genius of this way of writing is that the book of Revelation picks up ancient history where various empires and their leaders behaved like wine animals and say, look, this is going on through history. It's going to happen again. And you can understand it. So the imagery actually helps us understand more of the reality. That's what it's meant to do. John, let me put to you a question that I have asked people, often Christian audiences, and I've been quite surprised by the response that I get to this question, and that is this. If you could take a pill that would give you immortality, would you take it? And um, my assumption was when I'm speaking to Christians that they would say, Absolutely not. I wouldn't do that. But much to my surprise, many of them say, yes, yes, I absolutely would take that pill. John, you're coming up on your 80th birthday. Would you take that pill? I would, <laughs> I would want to ask what kind of <laughs> immortality? Because you see, do you mean physical immortality? Yes. Or do you mean, I wouldn't take the pill because I've already got immortality exactly. in the deepest biblical sense, which includes a physical immortality with a hiatus. <laughs> Possibly that is when I physically die, but that's a transit into another world. But 
the idea of eternal life. Jesus talked about, well, here's the basic text. Uh, he said, of a truth, I say to you, anyone who hears my word and believes in him that sent me, that is God, has eternal life. That is already, they don't have to wait until the after death, has eternal life and shall not come into judgment, but has, that is already, has passed from death to life. So I wouldn't take the pill because I suspect, since it's a physical pill, it would only be giving me physical um, endless life. But endless life in a world like this is not necessarily desirable. Yeah, and and that really is my point in asking the question. I might have been more specific, uh, but uh, I would have no desire. I have no desire as a man who's faced uh, very deeply um, his own mortality. I have no desire to continue uh, endlessly in this present reality because I have been given eternal life in the person of Jesus Christ in a different reality that is much better than this present reality. I mean, this world right. is hard. It's difficult. It's, uh, it is a struggle. And I listened to my father-in-law whose um, health is failing. And he has said to me many times, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. And I know he means it. He's, he's longing for that, that moment when Jesus Christ calls him home. You say this in the book, and I, I think this is very quotable. People are afraid of death for two opposite reasons. Firstly, some fear that there is nothing after death. Therefore, this present life is all there is. And so, rather than lose physical life, some people will compromise loyalty to God, to truth, to faith, to honor, to principle, and even descend to shameful cowardice, anything to save physical life. Fear of death holds them in moral slavery. That term, moral slavery, really sticks in my mind. Shouldn't we be fearing God more than man, more, more than death? Well, of course we should. Well, of course we should. And I feel exactly like you. I, I've lived almost 80 years. I've had several brushes with death, very near to death, in fact. Yes, you have. And in, in that sense, and so have you. And and that absolutely, I'm ready to go. I'm looking forward to the next five, uh, the next phase. And that's the exciting thing, you see. People who don't have this kind of hope, then this life is all there is. So let's try and enhance it. Let's try and take drugs. Let's try and uh, turn ourselves into cyborgs. What is being confessed in a lot of this uh, AI hype and transhumanism is an, a desire for something that they're not going to find where they're looking for it. You know, the philosopher Wittgenstein once said something that I've been thinking about a great deal. Uh, he said, the sense of the world, that is the meaning of the world, is not going to be found in the world. Or the meaning of a system won't be found in the system. I, I think that's a very profound insight. Trying to sort these questions out and answer them within the framework of the world or science or anything else is doomed to failure because there is something bigger, and that is God. That reminds me of a quotation which, of which I'm sure you're very familiar of C.S. Lewis, who after, you know, Yuri Gagarin and Sputnik went into um, space, uh, Khrushchev said, um, we went into space and we looked for God, but we didn't find him there. And C.S. Lewis said, I don't think if you found him down here that you're going to find him up there either. Let me ask you a final question, John, and that is this. Amidst all of this, which is so complicated and frightening, you know, the implications that you're, you're speaking of here, and we're just really scratching the surface. Again, we point you to Professor Lennox's, Professor John Lennox's book, 2084. You can find it on Amazon. You can find it everywhere. Where do we find hope? Where do people listening to this find hope? I would very much hope, especially if they read my book, that it'll begin to show them that the 
Bible has something to speak into our current world to give us real hope. Real hope in the presence of suffering, in the presence of disease, and in the presence of all the uncertainties that are generated by failing economies, loss of jobs, and all this kind of thing. And I spent my life checking on the viability, validity of the Christian hope, and I find nothing to match it. And the reason it is a sure and solid hope, as people say, is that it transcends death. And all these attempts, uh, transhumanism and all the rest of it, as Harari says, they are driven by the fear of the process of dying and death and what they believe is annihilation. If you've got an answer to death, you can face almost anything. And we have through Christ's resurrection and his return. John, um, as we close, I just make this observation. Something that was a profound revelation to me through the pandemic uh, that I wasn't prepared for um, was the discovery of uh, a an unseemly fear of death. People who reacted, uh, overreacted to um, someone not wearing a mask or the fear that somebody didn't have the vaccine or the, uh, needing to keep social distancing or hiding in their homes because they lived in a kind of terror. And I found that very insightful because no Christian, no Christian should live that way. By that, I don't mean that you're not sensible about the the way you um, you know you live your life and take uh, some measure of precaution. On the other hand, um, death is no, we do not believe as Christians that death is the worst thing that can happen to us. We, we don't believe that, but too often Christians do live that way. Professor Lennox, it has been a delight to have you with us today, and um, I wish you nothing but every success, and I hope you just continue to churn out these kind of books. Thank you very much. Let me say a few words about Professor John Lennox. Now, I introduce him uh, you know a little bit about who he is, Oxford University professor, uh, all-round um, intelligent man and uh, Christian theologian, writer, scientist. My relationship with John Lennox goes back to 2006. And as I mentioned in this interview, at that time, the new atheists, as they were known, um, were really making waves with a spate of best-selling books saying, essentially, there's no God. There's no hope. There's no anything. And um, these books were not just simply uh, being read by academics. They were penetrating the mainstream so that you had high school kids and college students who were reading these books and dealing, as I do, with so many in that particular demographic, I could see that many of them were buying into this. Um, they were really kind of gobbling it up without, without really any critical thinking that was involved. And so I thought, you know, we, we really need to take these guys on, but I need the right person to do it. I'm not a scientist. I'm perfectly happy to debate, uh, you know, Christopher Hitchens on history or philosophy, or Christian theology, and, and I did. But I'm not going to debate Richard Dawkins on the science. Um, he's a scientist, and I'm not a scientist, and you know, I'm I'm not I'm not following the cobra into the high weeds. So I realized that I needed a scientist to do that, and so I was at Oxford University for a conference, and I heard someone I'd never heard of John Lennox before. Almost no one in the United States had. And I attended his lecture. And as I look around the room, there's maybe 15 or 20 people who are in this room, you know, just a larger room and just kind of sparsely populated. He had, he had been um, put on the agenda really towards a time where a lot of people were out to dinner and this kind of thing. I sat in the back and I sat like this towards the door. You know, the door is here so that I could make a quick escape if I, if I, if I thought this wasn't particularly good. And it didn't take long that once he started speaking, I began turning around and listening to what he was saying. And I thought it was absolutely fantastic. And then as I looked to see it as credentials, I mean, 
He's a mathematician, philosopher of science. Um, Oxford pedigree. So I went and asked him, um, would you be willing to come to Birmingham, Alabama and to debate Richard Dawkins, um, your Oxford University colleague? I mean, their offices are, gosh, not a half mile apart. I mean, they're, uh, Oxford University isn't a, it isn't a single, it isn't a building. The university, uh, uh, when we when we speak of Oxford University, it's almost metaphysical because it's a collection of about 40 colleges and university that are all over the city of Oxford. And I think at that time, I don't know if he is now, but um, Dawkins was at New College, which was founded, I think, in the 13th or 14th century. So it's hardly new. And John Lennox was at um, what was then known as Green Templeton College. And you know, he said, you know, uh, that is Lennox. He said, you know, maybe you should get somebody like Phil Johnson. Um, uh, uh, Phil Johnson, who is who is uh, well known as, I think he was a, a professor at uh, University of California, Berkeley. And, uh, and I said, well, you know, I like Phil Johnson. He's a super smart guy, but he's a lawyer. That's not what I need. I need a scientist. And he said, well, how about so-and-so? How about this person? I said, no, I, I really think you're the right guy for this. And he said, you know, I haven't really done any debates. But anyway, um, I did prevail upon him to come to the United States and do this. And it was the, the, the journey was fascinating for both of us because we came, became quite close during that period of time. And it is because... Um, and this this was a big thing. Uh, I managed to get the, the you know the New York Times interested, NPR interested, the Wall Street Journal interested. It seemed like uh, Fox News was there. You name it, people were there, and um, we were filming it. Um, we were broadcasting it live, and this was kind of the early days of doing that kind of thing. We were we were broadcasting it live on the internet, on our website. And our website collapsed that night during the debate with over 2 million views. We just didn't have the bandwidth to, to sustain it. So it collapsed. Place was packed. And, um, and it was a very civil, fascinating, interesting discussion. I think that the, the biggest complaint of people in watching the debate was that they felt like it ended too soon. And, you know, there's a principle in doing just about any event, and that is leave people wanting more rather than wanting to leave. <laughs> and so I think we achieved that. Dawkins and Lennox had a, a fantastic discussion that night, but the 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 mood was that, was that uh, Richard had just been annihilated in that particular debate. And the reason for that is, in my opinion, I mean, first of all, Richard is defending what is, in my opinion, a, an intellectually untenable position. Uh, you know, the atheist will act like theirs is the default position. It isn't the default position. The idea of everything springing from ex nihilo, that is, out of nothing, not from pre existing matter, not from pre existing material but that everything that we see in the universe from, the, from the, the atom straight on up to consciousness, that it all just randomly assembled out of nothing is absurd. As one scientist put it, who to my knowledge is not a believer, he said the idea that, that, that the natural order, uh, that the, the human genome naturally assembled itself, that is, assembled itself on its own, is about as likely as a tornado going through a junkyard and leaving a fully assembled 747 in its wake. It's, it just doesn't happen. It's not going to happen. It can't happen. And as John would point out, it's mathematically impossible. But there was another reason that I think that Richard lost that debate, and it was because he didn't take Lennox seriously. He didn't take him seriously. He didn't really prepare. The night before the debate, he texted me and said, hey, can you get me a copy of Lennox's book? And I thought, holy smokes, you're going into this debate and, and, and you've not prepped? You've not prepped? By that time, John had read Dawkins' book, The God Delusion, I think 12 times, 12 times. He'd been preparing for months 
for this debate. He, he, he knew Dawkins is thinking backwards and forwards, and Dawkins didn't take him seriously. The result was he got into the debate and just got annihilated. And it's interesting because I think it was Bertrand Russell who referred to his critics the English philosopher, the British philosopher, who was an atheist, who, when asked about his critics, he, uh, you know, what he thought of them, he says, well, you know, does a dog care about his fleas? You know, meaning, I don't mind them. They're just insignificant and unimportant. I'm too important for that. And, and Dawkins has often, you know, said basically the same thing. Going into the debate, as we're as we're driving there, as I'm driving him there, he's reading. He has his his glasses down on his nose, and he is holding Lennox's book like this, and he says, "This is no flea," <laughs> which was great. This is no flea, and uh, and that's what transpired. But it began a much larger journey. And by the way, you can find these all on my channel on YouTube. You can find them all, all these debates are on my channel on YouTube. Some of them have millions of clicks, millions of views. They certainly had millions of views at the time. So Dawkins was ready to take on Lennox again. So there became, there was a, that, that first debate took place in 2007. The second was a discussion that was, um, it wasn't filmed. It was just three of us in a room along with a sound engineer. It was just, it was just a, you might call it a, a podcast. You might call it a radio show there. Again, there was no video, but it was just a discussion uh, between the two of them at Trinity College, Oxford. I arranged that particular encounter as well. And I just sat there and more or less got them started and got out of the way. And then there was a third encounter and that took place at Oxford University's Museum of Natural History. And I chose Oxford Museum uh, of Natural History for this reason. It's, it's where Wilberforce and Huxley debated. Uh, Thomas, not Aldous Huxley, debated in 1860, a very, very famous uh, location for their debate. And so I positioned the two of them. I put them beneath the T-Rex. Uh, there and National Geographic was there. We underlit the T Rex. It was very cool. The two of them, you know, sitting uh, beneath uh, that, uh, you know, those those remains. And uh, again, I moderated that discussion. Place was absolutely packed to the gills, standing room only. We decided to allow people to come in and actually stand um, around in the balcony. So again, a fascinating discussion. But just before it, so that was October of um, 2008. Just before it, in August of 2008, I had arranged a debate between John Lennox and um, Christopher Hitchens, their first debate at the Edinburgh International Festival, not the Fringe Festival, but the festival. And I don't, I don't know, I think that took place in a, in a church of maybe and to hold maybe 1,400 people. And people vote before the debate what their, their position is on the proposition. And the proposition had to do with atheism. Is it will, Would Europe be better um, atheistic or Christian? And uh, can atheism save Europe is the name of that debate. Again, you'll find it on the YouTube channel. And before the debate, people voted that atheism would be better for Europe, after the debate, they voted no that that it would be better Christian, meaning they voted that Hitchens had lost. And interestingly enough, I debated Hitchens, you know, shortly thereafter, and in one of our more amusing conversations, uh, he said, "You know, I've never lost a debate." And I said, "Well, there is that little small matter of what happened in uh, Edinburgh, where the audience voted that you did in fact lose." He goes. Well, yes, of course. <laughs> you know, he was very good natured um, about it, but he lost. And then the debate took place between Dawkins and Hitchens at the Oxford Museum of Natural History, but it didn't end there. So that was three encounters right there between Lennox and Dawkins. So they were really going at it with one another. Then I get a call from PBS 
asking me to help them arrange for the Charlie Rose show. Charlie Rose, is he even on television anymore? He was a, he was a victim of Me Too, wasn't he? He was a target of Me Too. He, he made some comments or something that, that ended his career. But the Charlie Rose show was very popular for, I don't know, maybe a couple of decades. He was kind of the Larry King of PBS, for those of you who don't remember him. And the Charlie Rose show, his producer had called me and asked, you know, could I help them arrange a debate between Dawkins and Lennox? Now, what's very interesting about this one is they already had Dawkins. Dawkins had already agreed. And Charlie Rose wanted to host a debate on his own program. And Dawkins said, I want Lennox. So they contacted me and asked me whether or not I'd help them arrange that. And I did. And so I flew to New York with John um, for that particular debate. And by the way, that was a good debate. That was a very good debate between the two of them. It was rich with content. But guess what? PBS never aired it. They never aired it. And my own theory as to why they didn't air it is because, because not because Dawkins looked bad or because Lennox looked bad. It's because Charlie Rose looked bad. They had an... <laughs> it was so funny. I'm sitting there. I'm watching this. And they have this, this, you know, as they do, they've created a set with images behind them. And behind them is the, the you know, the gray bearded image of uh, Charles Darwin, who is right behind them. So they're debating evolution, uh, macro evolution, as we might call it. And um, Charlie Rose begins by saying, well, I see we have here looking down upon us. We have Charles Dickens. And <laughs> in a very humorous moment, both Dawkins and Lennox kind of look at each other as if to say, which of us is going to tell him that this is not Charles Dickens, it's Charles Darwin. And listen, it's a mistake that anybody could easily make. And in the course of doing this podcast, I very frequently you know, have to repeat myself because sometimes you misspeak as he did, but it was funny. It was actually very funny. And as the debate went on, um, Charlie Rose just got steamrolled because he couldn't control the debate. The two of them were just going at it with each other, which to me was made for great imagery, great television. However, he must have not been very pleased with the result because they never aired the debate. And in some sense, the debate continues to this day. However, I will say this. I think that Dawkins has been a little taken aback by where the God debate has gone. Uh, uh, that is to say, I think that what we're seeing with this kind of radical atheism uh, that, that animates guys like Yuval Noah Harari, I'm, I see them as the ideological children of guys like Richard Dawkins. That is to say... They kind of set them loose, but, but, but Richard is restrained at least a little bit by the fact that he, he inhaled deeply of a Judeo-Christian, of, of a culture that was deeply influenced by Judeo-Christian culture. So he's not prepared to go where they go. He's not prepared as a scientist to say a man can be a woman and a woman can be a man. He's not on board with all that stuff, which fascinates me because now in an unlikely um, alliance, I find myself agreeing with some of the new atheists of you know 15 or 20 years ago who are saying, whoa, 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 we, 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 this transgender thing makes no sense. And I'm with them. I'm like, yes, I do agree with you on that. However, their worldview doesn't support the very things they're saying, meaning that once you annihilate belief in God, you just say there is no God. It isn't simply that you arrive at a place where you have a settled disposition on a single question, there is no God, there are dominoes that fall from that. And one of those is absolute truth. Another that is hinging on that, that is anchored in that, is the ideas of justice, of hope, of meaning. Uh, you know, we're teleological beings. We need meaning. And Lennox has readily 
perceived all of this. And it's why he has gone after the new atheists and now guys like Yuval Noah Harari. So that just gives you a little sense of who this guy is. And again, it was very funny. One time we were going to speak at a high school together. And as we're going in, he said, what should we talk about? You were going to sit on the stage together. And I said, well, why don't you tell them that you were a student of C.S. Lewis? And he said, would they be interested in that? I said, yeah, I think they would. I, I, I think they would. Um, it's quite fascinating. Now, the way they define that in the UK is a little different than we do here. He said, well, technically I wasn't his student. I was, I was in his class and I attended his lectures. I said, here, John, that would mean you're his student. Uh, maybe maybe you weren't one of the students he was tutoring, but you did attend. Now that was after that was after Lewis had left Oxford. Uh, he was he 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 felt he really wasn't embraced there because you know of his fictional writing. Cambridge said we'd be delighted to have you, and so he came, went to Cambridge University and spent his final years there. And the way Lennox describes um, Lewis, who by this time was quite famous, is. He will say, and it's great to hear him tell the story, and we have it somewhere on uh, on our, our channel, um, him describing this. But he says that students would be sitting in the room ready, and he said Lewis would come through the doors, just not stop. He would come through the doors, and he would begin unwinding his scarf, this considerable scarf that was around his neck. And he would walk to the front of the lecture hall, unwinding it and taking off his coat and hanging it, he would lecture. And then as he saw the clock that it was nearing the end of the lecture, he would reverse the process. And so he would keep talking, go and put his jacket on and begin walking up the aisle to the doors while he's putting the scarf on and hit the doors and go out. And it was his way of avoiding the crush of students who all wanted to talk to him, maybe get an autograph or something to that effect. But anyway, really fascinating stuff. John Lennox, I strongly encourage you to read his books. Uh, he has many books on a variety of subjects and um, you will find him fascinating. But, but again, you can find a lot of this on our YouTube channel. You'll find all the debates on the YouTube channel, including mine with Christopher Hitchens and I think, uh, uh, Michael Shermer and um, the Al Jazeera debate I did with Dan Dennett and others as well. But it's a pleasure to engage him. And I hope you'll, you'll find what he has to say very beneficial on artificial intelligence.